there's only two ways that we make decisions in life. We either make decisions out of fear or we make them out of opportunity. If we make them out of fear, they almost always lead to regret and shame and guilt. If we make them out of opportunity, they always lead to growth and happiness and success and fulfillment. Welcome back. We've got a really, really good one today. It is my honor, truly, to host and bring you this podcast. As you know, it's about exploring mindset and resilience and performance and health and fulfillment. Really, anyone looking to, to grow, to get unstuck, to take it to the next level, maybe get a new perspective on something. This could be about uncovering or furthering your purpose, your one thing, or just showing up to your fullest every single day. And to that end, I'm super excited to have talked to today's guest and to bring to you Patrick Sweeney, a former Olympic level athlete, tech entrepreneur, a guy who was working 75 hours a week, feeling exhausted, unfulfilled. If that sounds familiar, as you know, many overachievers are driven by insecurity, fear, their, their shadows. And Patrick was exactly the same until a brush with death. Now, and, and this guy might be my new hero because he has figured out how to be a full-time adventurer, lives in Chamonix, France with his wife and three children where he runs the Fear Institute. I caught up with Patrick last week while he was traveling the U.S. conducting some training. And we talk about why it's so critical that we all have to find more fear. Patrick has a book pre-selling now coming up early in 2020 called Fear is Fuel. And in today's episode, we talk about the biology and the neuroscience of fear, both from the perspective of performance as individuals and as parents. So one of the things I took away that I had no idea about is that there's something called epigenetics where fear can be biologically passed along to, to children. We also talked about the science of courage and training courage of updating that mental database for ourselves and, and training courage into our children. And we talked about seeking out fear to train it, to understand its biology, to recognize it, and how to work through it. We talked about breathing. We even talked about some next level things Tom Brady, the Patriots quarterback, is doing to train and address fear for his game performance. So really interesting stuff. All the links to Patrick and his website, his Fear Institute, and some other things he recommended will be on my website at manofmastery.com slash 025 for episode 25, manofmastery.com slash 025. All right, guys, let's jump into this super interesting chat and learn from Patrick Sweeney, the fear guru. All right, hey, today I'm joined by Patrick Sweeney. Uh, so Patrick and I actually met by way of the Spartan Up Media Fest in, in Tahoe at the recent World Championships, and I, I owe them a thank you as well as ATP Science for what brought us together. But as, uh, as some of you guys know, a lot of what we're doing on this, on this Man of Mastery concept and community and podcast is about growth, and growth specifically through adversity, talking about mindset, which really a lot of times means getting outside your comfort zone, and comfort zone means facing fear. So Patrick Sweeney is the perfect guy to speak to us about this today. He is a, a reformed technology entrepreneur, now full-time adventurer, best-selling author, and has an upcoming book pre-selling now called Fear is Fuel. Patrick, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Michael, thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor. Yeah, no, honor's all mine. So you and I were talking a little bit offline about fear and how fear once paralyzed you in life. And then you had a pretty dramatic wake up call. I, I think, uh, I think it's Tony Robbins that says people do things out of inspiration or desperation. So you had a big one that's really turned your life in a new direction. And I believe changed your entire mindset and approach on fear as a, as a paralyzing factor into something that's really fueled you and your family and your adventures. So do you mind giving us a little background on that? No, Michael, I'm happy to share the story. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to be researching and doing this for, uh, gosh, now six years um, full time and run into so many people who were in the same situation I was. And, and I grew up um, very blue collar, Boston, uh, first generation Irish immigrant family. And uh, I was the first kid in my family to go to college and 
I had, you know, uh, a childhood where my dad was away most of the time trying to find, um, you know, trying to find work or at different jobs. And uh, we, we got, you know, we, we had uh, Bisquick uh, for dinner, Bisquick pancakes for, for dinner, usually two or three times a week, because that's all, that's all we could afford was Bisquick and water. And so, uh, so I couldn't eat pancakes till I was about 25 years old. <laughs> and I swore, I swore I'd never eat them again. But, but it's good because it helps keep me on the keto diet. Um, but the, you know, growing up because of, of how and where I grew up and now I know the neuroscience behind it, I was terrified of everything. So I was the biggest sissy you could possibly imagine and, and just afraid of, uh, you know, social things, afraid of physical things, afraid of, uh, dying and all this stuff. And so because of that, like so many people, I had, I had a tremendous amount of toxic, uh, guilt and, and shame. And I didn't realize that that was creating the, the stress hormone called cortisol in my body almost nonstop. And so I, I tried, like a lot of people do, to, to cover it up. You know, I tried first with athletics, then I tried with, with this. Um, I spent five years training for the Olympics, and, and I thought all those things would bring me courage. And instead, it was really just creating this cocoon around me. So people wouldn't really see what was inside, wouldn't really see the real me. <clears throat> so um, when I found out one morning, you know, uh, after the gym that I, I couldn't move my arm, I didn't, I was too afraid to go to the doctor. Um, and so I ended up waiting two or three days. And by the time I got there, he said, you know, I don't know what's going on, but we can't handle it here at Reston Hospital. We're going to send you to the best hospital in the world, Johns Hopkins. And when I went to Hopkins, uh, you know, the, the first thing the doctor asked me, so I had a one-year-old daughter at the time, and my wife was six months pregnant, and the doctor asked me if my affairs were in order. <laughs> and, wow. and as you know, Michael, that's, uh, that's pretty much doctor speak for you're fucked. Right. So, uh, so it was, it was a, a huge wake-up call, and, and that was my, uh, you know, my initial life-changing event. And, and I went into Hopkins thinking I was about to die, and... And literally a part of me did. Um, but when I got out, we can talk about some of the details around it. I just decided that, that I was going to choose courage. And, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to live a life of regret like that because I, I saw the end of it very clearly. And, uh, and all I felt was regret and shame and, and sadness. And so, uh, because of that, I made the choice to, to try and figure out how to overcome or, or tackle or, confront my fears and my biggest fear at the time was flying so uh so i i took that head on but it was it was that life-changing event that led to what my mission is now and that's to help millions of other people learn how to use fear as fuel by understanding the neuroscience behind why our our minds and bodies and and cells do what they do right okay yeah perfect i'm glad you brought up the that you are not just somebody who's learned by experience and anecdotally, so you, you really got deep in the science of this stuff. You already mentioned some of the physiology of, of the cortisol buildup that you feel like led to some of your major medical problems. And I, you know, I, I think a lot of the audience, if people are tuning into this, they may know who you are or they're already interested in mindset and things like learning to harness fear, learning to lean into that fear, but may not know where to start. So it could be somebody who, well, you know, I'll say it this way. You were in a way lucky enough to have that major medical event, right? That propelled you in a new direction in life. And, and some other people aren't, or maybe we, we do it and we seek out a death ritual visualization or an obituary visualization that can help us, I don't know, maybe have the bravery to go to a new, a new direction. But I think what a lot of us struggle with is whether it's those big sea change decisions in life or whether it's what we do on a on a daily basis more tactically the concept makes sense yeah lean into fear but what does that really mean and I, I think you've told me you have a platform that puts some structure into not only the concepts but applying them in reality well the and it's interesting how it came about michael because after 35 years of just being a complete wimp, I got uh, to the point where all of a sudden, after about six months after getting out of the hospital and starting flying lessons and, and doing some other things, 
um, it, it turns out courage is, is one of my superpowers. And uh, the, the flying story is a great example of that because it, it resonates with so many people out there. I saw a plane crash on the news when I was a kid. And that created what I call in the book a, a fear frontier. And we all have these fear frontiers, these traumatic moments when we're a kid that shape our subconscious. And, and uh, that creation of that fear frontier led me to, be, to miss out on, on so much of life, on exchange programs, on spring breaks, on visiting friends and relatives, because I was terrified to fly. And so when I got over it, uh, I, I, said, I said, when I got out of Hopkins, I'm going to get over this fear of flying, even if I'm kicking and screaming and crying when I do, I'm going to go get my private pilot's license. And the first, you know, the first lesson, I, I probably went to the bathroom four times before we even got to the plane. <laughs> and, and it was terrifying, like completely terrifying. The second lesson, you know, I was a little more used to all the things that happened. But then we hit some turbulence. And I, I actually think I pooped myself just just a little bit, not a ton. <laughs> just a little. And and, uh, and and then the third or fourth flight, I fell in love with flying. And I got my private pilot's license. I went on and got my commercial rating, got my instrument rating so I could fly in any weather. And now I do exactly what would have terrified me just 15 years ago. I, I compete in uh, acrobatics. So I'm upside down, spinning, taking 5Gs, rocketing towards the earth. And it's such a sense of accomplishment and pride and, and, and fulfillment that I wondered what what fear was locking away from other people. So your listeners out there, what is it locking away from you that you don't even know of? Because when I got to the other side of fear, I found all my dreams. And you know, now I split time between Chamonix, France and Boston. I travel all over the world speaking and my mission is to help people discover what fear is hiding from them and, and what they don't know out there that, that exists for them. And so when I found out that, that courage was becoming a superpower of mine, I was lucky enough uh, a couple of years after that to ride in a charity race in Boston, a, a bike race, a hundred miler, uh, when at about mile 30, we were settled into our pace. I ended up riding next to a neuroscientist from Tufts University. And I said, listen, I'd love to learn how this happened to me and why it took 35 years for me to you know, figure this shit out. And he said, okay, come on into my office. We're studying, you know, uh, trauma and and how we process memory. So I went in and talked to him for, you know, an hour, had coffee. He said, you should really go see Scott Orr over at Harvard. He's doing all this uh, PTSD studying and you'd find it fascinating. Went and saw Scott Orr. And Scott said, oh, you need to talk to Mo Malad. Mo's, uh, you know, doing all this research on how we consolidate memories and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so... After the fourth or fifth neuroscience that I, neuroscientist that I got kicked around to, I found all this new information that we've only discovered literally in the past five to seven years so fascinating. Like just the, the fact that now we're understanding how the mind works and, and a lot of it won't be published for a couple of years because the peer review process and, and you know, finishing up their grants and everything else. But, but I got all the early information. And that's what I put into the book is, the, is all of this in a format so that people don't have to take 35 years of trial and error to figure this out. That they can say, you know, I'm going to do these two explorations and then I'm going to follow this framework. And it's pretty much the, the layout of the book. It's, it's a lot more in-depth than that, but it really requires that we do a handful of explorations. And to do that, this is completely counterintuitive, we have to find more fear. So we have, the, one of the things I tell people all the time is we should scare ourselves every single day. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. And it's, it's amazing to me that you, when you got out of the hospital and maybe, maybe when you face something that big, you decide the next thing you're going to face is really big too. You went after your biggest fear. You didn't chip away at the smallest stuff first. You went after the biggest one, fear of flying. That was fear, it, yeah. And it's turned into not only something you can deal with, but an absolute passion and a love of yours. Well, and, and that gets to my mission and, and everyone else out there who's wondering what their mission is. I think it's entirely dependent on your motivation. So if you're trying to be, I know um, 
uh, you talked with CJ Kirk about about uh, being in service to other people. And I think part of that is so true. So I was second in the Olympic trials in the single skull. And I, and I think I could have won a, a gold medal in the Olympics if my if my motivation was better. And I, I had three very successful tech companies raised about 50 million bucks in venture capital and debt and sold a couple of them and did really well. But I think, you know, one of them that I that I sold too early out of fear is now a three billion dollar company, and uh, and so I think because my motivation was faulty, is what cost me dearly. So I think if you look at your mission, you're trying to figure out what your mission is, then finding that motivation that really would would allow you to go into a burning building. So for me, that turned out to be my daughter. And when I was in Hopkins and they told me, you know, there's a good chance I might not make it out, the only thing I could think about was my one-year-old daughter, Shannon, and was the memory of her dad going to be this guy who's too afraid to get on a plane and take her to Disney World? Never mind, never mind take her around the world. So that became my motivation to, to learn how to fly. And then, and then once I started to, to learn how to fly – it opened up a whole new world for me, Michael, and, and, and just the act of facing that fear head on, feeling those, those butterflies, feeling that nauseous, feeling, feeling the, the tightness in my chest and saying, okay, well, that's, that's the fuel I need to, to power me through this stuff. And, and that's what's going to make my, my body work better, my mind work better. And so I, I figured out how to use it, but uh, that was, you know, that was most definitely the, the tough way. You know? I don't, I don't recommend that people go into Hopkins and spend, uh, you know, and, and start worrying about their will and ask their their friends who are priests to come in and, you know, and and give them their best. No, not not if you don't have to. But I, I can relate with what you mean about your daughter. I mean, that's that's super powerful. I have an 11 year old boy. I actually I, I did a I, I did a podcast not too long ago about you mentioned Mark Devine I think when we were offline and I and I did his twelve hour twenty x boot camp back in July and man I had a lot of anxiety a lot of fear going into that thing and and during the event Mark asked me why I was there and I I talked about my son and and you know really I said my son's my hero and I'm here to try to learn to be stronger and better for him. So, you know, sometimes we can go out and create those sort of fear events, those crucibles, the things that I think you're saying do something that causes you fear that makes you scared every day. And and I know you even got something that you call the fear institute. So I think you're you're working up towards your framework and your your approach. But but let me ask you this. If I just jump to I, I know you deal with a lot of corporations, executives, successful people, and I imagine when you ask about fears and hidden fears, you probably often get a reaction of, you know, I, I don't, I don't really have any hidden fears or I don't have any major fears, yeah. Yeah. but I have to think that they're certainly amongst successful people and maybe especially amongst successful people. A lot, a lot of us carry an imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, I, I was talking to a buddy, I won't name, but just recently guys, a, a an ex Navy seal, you know, these are some of the toughest guys in the world. And he's out in the commercial world now, and I, and I was picking his brain, just going, "Hey, man, sometimes, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm really working my butt off, and and you know, it kind of bothers me if I feel like there's dead weight around me on the team. You came from such an elite background. Do you ever feel that way out in the corporate world?" And he goes, "Are you kidding? I feel like I'm the dead weight. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. there's no way that's possible. So, I mean, I don't know if you call that a fear, but I think that." That fear of am I am I really good enough that I get here by luck? Am I doing the right things that caused my success and can I keep it going? Is a hidden fear with a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you mentioned a bunch of the CEOs I've worked with. I have a, a, a story I like to tell a lot about this um, uh, this group of ten CEOs who brought me in to spend a weekend with them and and look at some of this stuff. And their motivation was so they could create a culture of courage at their companies. Uh, a couple of them are big publicly traded companies. And two of the guys were billionaires who were there, showed up on their G550. And I said, actually, to, to one of them, I said, uh, you know, well, we were all talking together. And I said, this weekend, we're going to first start out working on your hidden fears and your fear frontier, as I refer to it in the book. And, and he, he looks up at me and like in, in the most cocky, uh, serious way you could think of, he said, 
I don't have any hidden fears. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, genius. That's why they're called hidden. Right. And, and, and so when we got into the exploration of the fear frontier, which I think is, is uh, one of the first things that people have to do if they're going to learn how to use that fear as fuel in all facets. So I can talk a little bit more about why SEALs – um, cause I've worked with a bunch of Navy SEALs as well and am good friends with Mark Devine and, and I can talk about why a lot of them have trouble integrating, um, you know, after they got out of the SEALs and after they, they lose their identity of, of being a SEAL and being part of a brotherhood and, you know, that, the, that's their form. 24 seven in the same, you know, living quarters. So that, that's a whole different story and I'm happy to shed some light on it. But the important thing that we need to know is, is whatever your, there, there are two parts of the brain. There's one part of our brain that's called the amygdala and it's a little almond shaped gland that sits at the base of your brain and that handles our fight, flight or freeze instinct. And this is something that has a two million year old piece of software running on it. So the only thing the amygdala cares about is procreating your genes onto the next generation. It doesn't give a shit about anything else. It doesn't care about creating a successful business, about having a happy relationship, about you know surfing the North Shore in Hawaii. None of that uh, matters to the amygdala. The only thing it cares about is procreating the genes. So the amygdala is what handles our fight, flight, or freeze reaction. And when the amygdala is triggered, or it, what it does is try to hijack our upper order level of thinking on, which sits on what's called our prefrontal cortex. And when it does that, we have a physiological change. Your body physically changes. So what I do in, in all my keynote speeches or, or any of my things is I'll try and figure out a way to scare the audience. And, and I did it yesterday and people were, you know, people were sitting there realizing that they were in a safe room in Caesar's palace, nothing was going on, but their body had changed dramatically just because of something I did. And, and what I wanted everyone to do is find what changes in their body they could notice. So that's the first exploration is to find your fear tells. So the more we scare ourselves, the more we figure out that when our palms get sweaty or when our jaw gets tight or when our, when our chest starts palpitating or our voice cracks, those are individual what I call fear tells. And they're specific to each one of us. So when you get scared, you're going to have a very different reaction than when I get scared. But it's always the same reaction. So the physio physiology of how that happens in our body, the, the fear cocktail that gets produced when the amygdala activates, it's adrenaline, cortisol, DHEA, all these hormones and enzymes, that's what causes those changes. And, and so if we scare ourselves every day, we start to notice what those changes are. And that does two things, Michael. It, it, it allows us to understand when there's an opportunity presented to us to, to choose courage. And it also gives us a much higher level of mental capacity and physical capacity that we can use to our advantage. And that's the, that's the whole concept behind using fear as fuel is once we start to understand what those things are, we'll recognize it. And, and it, won't, it won't end up making us uh, take these, these knee jerk reactionary decisions. Instead, we can be proactive and use that, that fear as fuel. And that's really the, the key component to the book. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I, I and I, I, you know, another time we could go down a whole nother path here of, you know, caveman days, fight or flight was a, was a very healthy thing when the, you know, the tiger came around the corner and that didn't happen too frequently, but the way we live our modern lives we have these these fears that are created and have this physiological effect. They're really not life or death fears, but our body is acting that way and acting that way very, very frequently, which becomes very inflammatory and very unhealthy. But I, I, quick, quick anecdote for you. So the way that I actually came to Mark Devine, to some of his techniques, to Unbeatable Mind, even Spartan Racing, and, and a lot of the things that you and I uh, have in common or brought us together – so I had I've flown since I was a kid, and I've flown very frequently as a as a business person. And then four years ago, sitting on a, a regional jet, they closed the door, and I just freaked out and felt like I couldn't breathe. First time it's ever happened to me, and I was the guy that was like, "Hey, sorry, let me off this plane." And after that, I went I went looking for I don't know what I searched, 
but you know, what, what is going on? What happened physiologically? What happened mentally? Am I looking for mental toughness? Am I looking for something physical? And it's led me down a whole path, a, a lot of which, and, and this may be some of where you're headed in, in terms of a tool set is I'm almost, I think exactly a, a year younger than you. I'm coming up on 48 years old. I am just now learning to breathe for the first time in my life. Mm. That's so important. You know, the, the breath has a direct connection to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nerve system. And, and so that's, that's definitely, Michael, part of my um, platform, part of what, what I call the BASE methodology in the, in the book. It's an acronym, B-A-S-E, and the B is for breathing. And, and the reason being, the, and the physiology behind it, again, this is why, so it, it, as you see the book, um, you'll, you'll notice that there's personal stories, both mine and, and other people's, and then there's the science behind why and how things worked and how it happened. And the breathing is, is such a great example because I use um, athletes as, as a perfect example because if you're David Ortiz in the bottom of the ninth, uh, seventh game of the World Series, with millions of people watching, your heart rate is, is super high. It's you know, 130, 140 beats per minute. And if you or I or one of your listeners get scared right now, our heart rate's going to shoot up to 130, 140 beats per minute. Now, if we're able to breathe, we can change the heart rate, heart rate from an erratic heartbeat, which if you look at an EKG would basically look like the, the silhouette of a mountain range. And, and there's you know, big changes and big differences. Once you learn how to breathe, you can literally change the heart rate from that erratic heart rate to a coherent heart rate which looks like a nice steady part pattern, the same distance between each peak and valley, and, and really a, a huge difference. And that's just from the breathing. So that's a tool that everyone should have in their, in their tool bag. And, and as you do the, as you get used to the sensations of fear, as you scare yourself every day and you start to get used to that feeling and, and start to understand that these changes are taking place in your body, because of that two million year old piece of software, it's okay. It's gonna feel like it does now and it feels that way, you know, when you go ask that hot girl at the gym out for a date, when you stand up at lunch at, at work and you make a toast, when you watch a scary movie at night, you know, you don't have to be jumping out of a plane to get that reaction. You just have to do something that gets you out of your comfort zone and then you start to feel that. Now the the other gland, I mentioned there are two two really important glands in the brain. The amygdala is one of them. The other is one that almost no one has heard of. It's one, because it's so difficult to say, it's a subgenial anterior cerebral cortex, or SGACC. And the SGACC is the courage center. And it's a center of, of good emotions and the center of courage. And there's a great study from the University of Israel, Israel uh, four or five years ago where they, they had people who were scared of snakes get into an MRI machine and either move a snake towards them or move it away from them, and they watch their brains. And the people who got in the MRI tube and became terrified of the snakes and couldn't control it, their amygdala lit up like a Christmas tree. The fascinating thing is the other people, and all these people before the test, they admitted they, they, they were chosen because they said they were afraid of snakes. And all the people who, who became courageous, they got in the tube, they started moving the snake towards them. Uh, they, they basically had it on a train track near their head and the snake was sitting in a box. And their amygdala lit up and then they chose, they made a decision, a conscious decision that they were going to move it closer anyways. And, and the amygdala immediately shut down and the SGACC started lighting up. And it was a fascinating finding because people had, you know, people were trying to figure out what creates courage and, and can we literally turn it on and turn it off. And so, so that first study that, that shows that people, once, they're, once they understand that there's going to be a change in their body when the amygdala activates, that they can then do something and choose courage. And, and a big first step in that is breathing, Michael. So, so you're, you're, you're spot on there. And I think it's, you know, for your listeners, I've got a, I do breathing in my morning routine. I do four or five things every morning and I do breathing every night before I go to bed. So it's, it's super important. 
Absolutely. You're a, you're a Boston guy. I'm a University of Michigan guy. So I, I, I don't know how Tom Brady does it, but that guy is, uh, he must have a heartbeat of like 60 when he's, he's steering the team to a, to a comeback victory. He's got to have some breathing going on. I'll actually give you one of Tom's uh, things. So, so I know the guys at, at TB12, so the CEO down there, John Burns, uh, JV, and of course, of course uh, Alex Guerrero, who started it. And one of the things Tom's been doing for the past six or seven years is sitting in a float tank to do breathing and meditation exercises. And what he's doing in that tank is learning how to control his amygdala. So by sitting in the float tank where, you know, he's basically in zero gravity, he's able to, to access his mind and teach himself to shut that amygdala off when he wants it off and to be able to switch that, that pathway towards courage and towards rational thinking. Because, it, you know, at the end of the day, Michael, there's only two ways that we make decisions in life. We either make decisions out of fear or we make them out of opportunity. If we make them out of fear... They almost always lead to regret and shame and guilt. If we make them out of opportunity, they always lead to growth and happiness and success and fulfillment. Hundred percent. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely on that program. So, in your approach and your your methodology, people learn to understand the tells, interpret the physical, see it coming, and then you talk about that opportunity, either turning fear into fuel or or choosing courage. And I imagine that that's just, it's got to take some reps. I think from my own experience, just the ability to witness that it's like building a muscle and getting better and faster at it to either head it off. So you don't go barreling down that adrenaline cortisol fueled rage or whatever it might be, or, or directed a, a good oppor- a good direction. So when you, when you work with a group, do you tend to is it repetitive? Is it a weekend thing? Is it a revisited on a regular basis type of methodology? Well, so the the first thing I do, and I'm doing it next week in Los Angeles. Actually, the um, there's a there's a new Marriott that's opening up uh, in Irvine, and um, so there's a, a group of about 25 CEOs and uh, some celebrities who are coming out to the Fear Seminar along with the um, the L.A. County Sheriff. So, so what I'm doing for them is we're all going up to the top of this uh, 20-story brand new Marriott hotel, and I'm going to push them all off. <laughs> so, so we're doing a repelling thing. And and when I've done I've done this uh, for a lot of CEOs through this organization, Young Presidents Organization YPO, and um, and when we do it, I stop them just when they're about 45 degrees to the wall over going over the edge, you know, with, with their ass hanging over the parking lot or, or, you know, whatever is down below and, and <clears throat> have them take an inventory there of how they're feeling. And so that's the first step of figuring out their fear tells. And that, that does two things. Like you said, one, it lets them know when they've got an op- opportunity to act with courage because courage only exists if there's fear. If there's no fear, you can't have courage. Courage is, is acting rationally in the face of fear, and it takes practice. Just like you said, it takes those reps because those neurons that fire together continuously will wire together. So the more practice you have, and this is that halo effect I was talking about that happened to me when I just decided to take flying lessons, I, I started wiring those neurons together to the SGACC, to, so to that courage center in my brain. So then my default became courage. You know, when I was sitting there and instead of being the guy in the $10,000 suit pulling up to the office in a $150,000 car, you know, telling everyone that we're going to kick ass and take names today, I was the guy who walked in and I said, look, you know, uh, our DOD contract is up in two months. I'm not sure if they're going to renew. I'm really scared. I, I'm, I'm really afraid, you know, the, it might be the end of the company. And, and people were looking at me like, who the hell is this guy? And, and and where the fuck did this honesty come from? Because we don't like it. <laughs> so uh, so I think, you know, the, the good thing about finding your tells and figuring it out is it lets you know when you have an opportunity to act. So when you get a phone call and all of a sudden you feel one of your tells, you notice your jaw gets tight or your heart starts beating, you know that, okay, well, the amygdala is trying to make the decision for me. I have a chance right now 
to create an opportunity, to make a decision based on opportunity instead of doing this knee-jerk bit. And, and so that's why it's such a great indicator of, of when you can make life to, life-changing decisions. Nice. Yeah, that, that sounds like an amazing training to really check in, hanging, hanging 45 degrees over the edge. Yes. Uh, and and I really, I've, I've seen some of your stuff talking about the importance of vulnerability uh, as opposed to maybe, maybe sort of fake courage in things like those big business meetings. So I, I don't want to, you know, your, the weekend seminars sound amazing. I know you've got the Fear Institute going. I don't want to give away all the secret sauce of the book, but you're a father of, I think, three you know, for those of us who are parents, you know, looking to pass things along to help our children, maybe learn some of these lessons earlier in life than, than we did, or whether it's, you know, you're going back into your next business meeting, or you're going to spar at the gym, or, you know, I'm, I'm at the start line of the next Spartan race. I mean, what are, what are some actionable things we can learn for ourselves or just a couple simple things to put into practice for ourselves and our kids? Well, well, Michael, I think you've got, you, you know, you, you got a, a whole laundry list of stuff and I'd, I'd love to talk to you and your listeners for a couple hours about it, but I'll start with the kids because I think that's so important. Uh, and, and the more neuroscience research I did, the more I started to realize uh, how critical it is that as parents, we do three or four very important things and and you know i end up i end up getting parental questions at every one of my keynote speeches so i'm i'm really happy to share this when a child is born remember we've got two centers of our brain the amygdala which handles the fight flight or freeze and that's just for survival and then the sgacc which is there for courage the amygdala is fully developed at birth so we have the ability to fight, flight, or freeze. We, we, we have fears, we're born with fears, we, we inherit through just one generation the fears of our parents in, in some respects, and there's some fascinating new research about that as well. So you being scared of something is gonna end up uh, passing on to your kids, so that's really important for parents to know that, that if they don't want their kids to have the same fears, they've gotta consciously do something about it. And then uh, as, as the brain starts to develop, the intelligent part, the part that can make rational decisions called the prefrontal cortex, that doesn't fully develop until we're in our early 20s. So somewhere between the age of 17 and 20 years old, that prefrontal cortex will develop. As it develops, other people are populating the d database that's going to make up our subconscious. So we don't we don't choose what language we speak. We don't choose the color of our skin. We don't choose how many brothers and sisters we have. And because of that, those are all the things that make up our subconscious database where we make 75% of our daily decisions. And it's all based on these things that, you know, in uh, thousands of years ago would have been called our tribe. So we could decide what was in our tribe and what wasn't in our tribe and, and understand when to be scared and when to fight and, and when to flee. That, that doesn't serve us anymore. That's part of that two million year old piece of software. But for a kid, that's all they've got. So if you're taking your kid rock climbing, which, which I did with all three of my kids and started them you know, around four years old, and I remember our youngest, we, we had all gone out for a great day of climbing and, and uh, he, was, he was doing his first real big climb and he went up and he ran up the, up the climb. We were on top rope, so uh, the anchor was at, at the top of the climb and the rope came back down to me on the ground and he was up there and I said, okay, Declan, sit back, let go. And he said, I can't, I, I can't, the rope might not fall. I'm, I'm going to fall. I, this could, I could die. Right. He just started screaming irrationally. And so I did the typical Irish parent thing. I started screaming back at him. Right. And, and I said, Declan, listen, let go of that rope right now. Or you're not getting ice cream when we all go out for ice cream afterwards. And he starts screaming back at me. And then I said, OK, Declan, we'll ne I'm never going to take you on a family vacation again. You know, if you aren't down in 30 seconds. And what I was doing was exactly the opposite of what we should have been doing, because I was I was reinforcing the emotional memory he was about to create associated with being up at the top of a climb. So I was, I was encouraging his amygdala to fight me. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to flee the situation, but when I put him in a corner, he wanted to fight. And so because he doesn't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex, and because there's no connection to that courage center, the SGACC, 
We have to do that for our kids. We have to help them fire those neurons together and build those neurons and those synapses, in fact, that are going to make them a courageous person. And if you look at guys, so, uh, you know, I, I think you, you'd mentioned, Michael, that I'm, I'm good friends with, with Div- Mark Devine, with um, Joe DeSena. Um, I've got a great Tom Brady story as well that just happened over the summer. All of us have, have been vilified or gotten in trouble for the way that we, for things we've done with our kids. So I was, I was in the news uh, six or seven years ago for taking my kids up Mont Blanc. And my middle child, my son PJ, who loves to mountain climb, has been up now probably 24,000 meter peaks. Uh, DeSena took his kid swimming in November in, their, uh, in a lake near their Vermont pond. And some woman saw it and called the cops and, you know, the TV camera showed up and all this nonsense. And, and uh, three years ago, my daughter and my wife and I went, I, I did a bike race down in Costa Rica. And we went to a yoga and surf camp afterwards in the town where Tom Brady and Giselle have a house. And she and I, Shannon and I jumped off this cliff at a waterfall, like 25 feet. And this summer, Tom Brady posted the exact same clip of he and his daughter jumping off the same location. And people were giving him shit for doing it too. So the things that you have to do to teach your kids to be courageous, to get them out of their comfort zone, in our society today is, is not a normally accepted way of parenting. But it is so critical from a neuroscience perspective that we do it. And the parents who aren't doing it are raising these kids who, especially when it comes to boys, who have issues with suicide, who have anxiety disorder, who, who have problems You know, when the stakes get really high and, and they're older adults and they haven't learned how to cope with fear and they haven't learned how to deal with deciding between between risk and fear and opportunity and all these things. So so it's so critical that we be the 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 adult supervision for a child's brain and we put them in positions where they have to start developing those connections and, and growing those synapses. So things like rock climbing, things like you know getting them out and and making them spend the night in the woods uh, you know things like getting them up in front of people to to speak publicly all this stuff that that kids find threatening we've got to teach them how to do it and and get them out there and and be good parents and ignore what other parents who you know who might give you a hard time about it have to say because they're the ones who are trying to be their kids best friend and and not serving their kids well yeah we've got these societal standards that I don't think anybody's really examining very, uh, very hard. But I don't know that anybody would stand back and say our our society is right where it should be right now. I'm I'm definitely a big believer in rite of passage type of events and, for our kids. And and there's just something about nature. Period. I I took my son for a week to Mount Whitney this summer and just getting out and you know getting dirty and running around and falling down and and connecting with nature it's just something we don't get enough of these days no matter what kind of event you might uh you might design for your kids and i think i think his name is Jamie Wheel an author uh that studied flow state and and knows mark as well he i heard him say that when his kids are old enough he's he's going to send them to mark divine for for a <laughs> crucible event or for a rite of passage go. event there you go, and then and then send them to Chamonix to the Fear Institute afterwards. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe uh, I'll I'll send my son over as well. He's he's only been to France once, so we'll we'll, we'll get him signed up for that. Well, hey, uh, I know we're running up against time, Patrick, and I'm really looking forward to the book coming out here early in in uh, 2020. I just pre-ordered earlier today. Where else can people find you or follow you in the interim? Sure. My website is, is pjsweeney.com, or you can also go to Fear is Fuel, which is the, the book website that'll be up. And uh, on Instagram, I'm the Fear Guru, and Twitter, PJ Sweeney. So I, I'd love to connect, and if they have any questions, um, uh, you know, I, I do my best on, on Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook, Patrick Sweeney as well, uh, to answer questions and, and help people out whenever I can. Because I think, you know, the, the key thing for anyone in your audience to remember, Michael, is there is nothing special about me. There's nothing special about Joe DeSena. There's nothing special about Mark Devine. There's nothing special about you, aside from the fact that we decided to, to face our fear 
stare it down, as Divine says, attack it, as DeSena says, and, and use it as fuel, as I say. And anyone can do it. Fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to it, Patrick. Uh, I will put in the show notes for this episode links to all the ways to connect with you. And then it sounds like you're also pretty active here in the U.S. and globally with speaking events and other seminars. So is that also available through your website? Uh, it is. We've got a we've got an events page on there. Um, there's a, a a really fun one I did last year, and you know, literally the week after the event, they they hired me for this coming year. It's in Martha's Vineyard uh, in June, called Relentless MV, and I'll give them a plug right now because uh, the the guy who runs it is this retired you know multimillionaire financier uh, named John Kane, and and he brought in. I mean, he spent literally. I don't know, three hundred thousand dollars on speakers. He brought in uh, ten of the the top speakers that I've seen, from Kobe Bryant's uh, you know conditioning coach to uh, to the first Canadian guy to uh, climb Everest without oxygen and row solo across the Atlantic, and just an amazing group of people. So we did some we did some fear exercises there. It's one of the few events I do that you know that isn't a, a corporate back thing or a YPO back thing that anyone can sign up to. And and I think the website is just Relentless MV for Martha's Vineyard, and they've got it running in in June sometime. So uh, for anyone who's interested in this stuff, that'd be a great a great way to to enjoy a, a weekend of uh, you know really self discovery and and pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. I will find that one fi- and provide the link for it as well. Check it out myself. That sounds like um, that sounds like the kind of mix my wife would, would sign up for. I can go do crazy stuff and she can hang comfortably <laughs> somewhere in Martha's Vineyard. There's, there's, there's some, well, you know what? They've got this, this kitchen that's run at this place called Lambert's Cove Inn, and they've got this kitchen that's all organic, locally grown stuff and fresh caught fish. And so, yeah, you get, you know, uh, it's not it's not like a divine experience where you're in the in the cold surf and the sand at, at 10 o'clock at night by by the time 10 o'clock rolls around you're having a nice glass of wine by the fireplace with you know with a with a gourmet meal getting ready for you <laughs> that might be the way to go you know mark did let me he gave us 12 minutes to eat a cold mre at i think five in the morning <laughs> that was 10 hours in so yeah it's a little little different approach but it's all good well, hey, Patrick, I'm going to let you run. Uh, I, I love that you're really so deep into the science of this stuff. I'm um, looking forward to the book, and I hope we can talk again in the future. Michael, I'd look forward to it anytime I'm in, and uh, hopefully we'll get to do something fun. Come over to Chamonix, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll find a couple more crucible things for us to do together. All right, I'll be over there this summer. Count me in. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. I learned a ton from that talk with Patrick. He really knows his stuff. We probably could have gone on for a, a long, long time. So I'm really looking forward to checking out his book. I've already pre-ordered it. It hits early in 2020, and maybe we'll have him back when that does come out to dig a little deeper and and go down one of these other tangents we just didn't have time for today. I'll tell you what, on the website, when I drop the show notes and this episode at manofmastery.com slash 025, I've also got a link to a little bit of a bonus where Patrick's got an article on what his morning routine looks like. Also, head over to Facebook or Instagram at The Man of Mastery and check out what we've got going on. I'll try to keep you posted throughout the week. And then we have a Facebook group that is getting ready to spin up here shortly. Okay, what else? Hey, if you're getting value out of this, if you think it's interesting, if it's a good use of your time, please share it. Tell a friend, get somebody else looped into the podcast or the Facebook or Instagram posts. Okay, that's it for today. Coming up next week. So today we talked about fear. Next week, we're going to talk about what is impossible and how to address things in our life that seem impossible.